Good day and thanks for joining us for this cab conversation. Today, Wendy Delmar, the CEO of the Caribbean Association of Banks, Inc., will be speaking with three financial luminaries. Our topic today, Know Your Net Worth, Managing Your Assets and Liabilities. And this is part of the financial literacy campaign being put out by the Caribbean Association of Banks. Today, you'll be hearing from Ryan Weber, Senior Vice President Investments with Raymond James. With over 15 years of experience in the financial services industry, Ryan understands the importance of providing first-class service and a diligent investment process to the clients he and his team serve. Charmaine Francois is the CEO of the National Commercial Bank of Anguilla. She's a dynamic, results-oriented, award-winning leader with over 20 years of progressive senior executive experience in the areas of bank management, business development, securities brokerage, and investment banking. And last but certainly not least, Dalton Lee is the chairperson of the Caribbean Association of Banks, Inc. He is a career banker and accountant, the principal of Veradenis Business Consulting, LLC, which provides financial consulting to small and medium-sized companies in the broadcasting, banking, financial services, e-commerce, and entertainment industries. And once again, they'll be having a conversation with Ms. Wendy Delmar, the CEO of the Caribbean Association of Banks, Inc., on the topic, Know Your Net Worth, Managing Your Assets and Liabilities. So, Dalton, as chair of the Caribbean Association of Banks, perhaps we can begin our questions this afternoon with you. And again, I want to say a special thank you to everyone for being present. I know that we're going to have a really, really fantastic discussion this afternoon, which I think will resound with everyone who listens in, um, specifically our members. But we certainly hope that members of the the general public who are able to listen in on this podcast will also have some questions for us, uh, or certainly their bankers within their various territories. And we would be happy to receive your questions through our social media channels as well as we progress through our discourse today. So Dalton, um, here's a really great question, I think, to kick us off today. How can an average person build wealth to leave, you know, a nice, comfortable nest egg when they have moved on? Um, Let's look at a figure that everyone aspires to join the million dollar club. (laughs) Well, Wendy, you know, first of all, thank you very much for for having me on this panel. I think the, the, the topics that we are about to discuss I think it would be very beneficial to not just to our members, but to their their customers within each of their territories. And I, you know, I I, I look forward to hearing their feedback and seeing what they have gathered from these um, from this podcast, particularly, but also from the broader month long um, endeavor of financial literacy that the Caribbean Association of Banks is undertaking in this month of September. That being said, I'll I'll try to answer your question or I will start answering your question. And I'm sure that my other two panelists will jump in as they see um, fit and and where I may fall. I I think the first thing that I would say is that it is very important for individuals who have that mindset to start planning early. I, I think the earlier you can plan, the better, the more likely you are to achieve your goal. I, 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 I um, <clears throat> the so if you're 25 and you you know you're going to work until you're 65, that gives you 40 years. Now, um, as you invest, the the um, the the method of com- of compounding interest is what is your best friend. I think most of the financial professionals will know of the rule of 72, which basically says that if you if you divide 72 by the int- the, com- the average compounded interest that you're earning on your investments um you will the resulting number will be the number of years that it takes you to double your investment so as an example if you're getting six percent on your your um your investments it'll take you about 12 years to double and there, you know, and and then another twelve years, and another twelve years. So, so I, I I think that's the first thing I would say is that you know try to start as early as you can, um, and the earlier you start, the more aggressive you can be with your investments. I think you know as you get closer to retirement and the need for some to for for the income, you don't want to be risking a lot of your um, your principal. 
So, you know, if you start early, you can be very aggressive in, 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 um, in growth stocks, um, you know, and probably coming out of emerging markets and stuff like that. Right. But I think having a, a, a strategy where mm -hmm. you start early and you contribute consistently to, right. your, to your retirement plan is, um, is, is, is the way to get to any target you set, regardless of the amount. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dalton. Um, Wendy, Wendy can this is Ryan. Can I, can I add on to this? Because he brought up a really good point. I think okay. what, what he's hammering home, I think, is important for everybody to understand the, the importance of starting early. And I think if we put it in numbers, maybe it'll even help resonate. So what I did is I took, let's just say you took $100 a month coming out of school at 22. You put $100 a month into you know, some type of investment program that you're going to earmark for retirement. And like Dalton said, the younger you are, the more average annual rate of return you could expect. So I took an average annual rate of return of about 8%. So if you were to put $100 a month starting at the age of 22, and you look at retirement age of 65, by the power of compounding, like Dalton said, you will have close to $500,000 in retirement savings which is a pretty powerful number when you put it in context. Okay, uh, absolutely. It's, it's definitely mind boggling and certainly something that I'm, I'm, I'm sure everyone would love to aspire to. So Shami, let me jump over to you. Um, you're the lady who has worked in a couple of the islands, actually perhaps three or four of the islands in the region. So when we think about investments, we're probably looking at it from a very different angle. What sort of vehicles are most common to our Caribbean banking system? And okay. does the same rule apply that we're hearing today? Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the Caribbean context, um, yeah, what, what in terms of um, vehicles that one can look at, immediate vehicles, um, again, when you look at how you, the approach to invest in, so in, initially mm -hmm. when one starts, like for instance, Ryan mentioned a 22-year-old, um, starting at $100, Earning a, a rate in, in, our, in our region, what would be typical for, for an investor around that range um, from as low as $100 would be to start off in a savings, a savings account. The right. good thing mm -hmm. for our region, on, a, on, a saving, on an ordinary savings account, one can still generate a return of 2% based on the mm -hmm. minimum rate that must be to depositors. So one can start you know, building that, that wealth monthly you know, on a savings account. Once you've generated, you've, you've accumulated enough, you can start looking at, uh, you know, other alternatives within the, the ECCU. For instance, on the regional government securities market, the minimum to participate in a treasury bill or to buy participate in bonds, government bonds or corporate bonds is 5,000 EC. So that would enable one to move from savings and start looking at investing, which is more long-term. So you can start with the T-bills, start with the bonds, which has a longer term horizon in terms of corporate bonds mm -hmm. and also equities. That would give you a return if you're looking at on the short end with treasury bills from as, as, as low as two, based on, again, based on the, the investment, the, the, the sovereign that you're investing in um, and can go as high as 6%. Um, so, so in terms of T-bills, that's some of the rates. In terms of bonds, um, can, which can pull you in terms of tenors up to around 10 and, and so, yes, you can generate a return from as, as on the low end of five to as high as seven and a half percent. So there are options that one can, can do in terms of building wealth. In the equities market, again, you'd have to, in, in terms of the ECCU, the rates are, are, are lower. Um, again, uh, if you average out based on just looking at the performance of the, of the index over, the, over the, the, the last, say, 10 years, you can average out out of, of around six, between six and eight percent. So, uh, if you have the pool of the pool of um, equities that that comprise the index, um, so for the, the region as as a whole, one apart from just keeping your funds on savings deposits, once you have accumulated enough, you can start to diversify out into, as I said, into treasury bills, government bonds, corporate bonds, equities, and not just in within the ECCU. You can look at the wider region where you can go into mutual funds um, um, outside, of, uh, outside of our space. Um, and likewise, internationally, as um, Ryan spoke to, in terms of the, the equities market, where you can generate an, an average return of eight and, and more. 
Um, mm-hmm. So the opportunities are there to build the wealth and to, and, and, and to, and to you know, amass significant nest eggs over a, a period of, a, over a period of time. Right. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that. Um, here's another question. I think that as I, as I have different discussions with persons that I come across with on a day-to-day basis, certainly we're having a lot more dialogue about stock and investments um, outside of the Caribbean than perhaps I've heard in the past. And I think we're, we're beginning to see a far more market savvy consumer than we have perhaps ever before. Um, what should we be looking for in choosing the right stock if we haven't done it before? And what is a good amount to begin investments with? Dalton, I'll throw that one out to you to start. Well, I was, I was going to suggest you throw that one out to Ryan, but, um, but, 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 uh, but I'll give it a shot. I mean, I, I will give it a shot. I, I think for those people who have not started and, and who are a novices to, um, um, to investing in equities outside of the region, I think the first thing I would recommend or what I would recommend is that they really don't pick individual stocks because I think, you know, the, the level of, of research that would be necessary for them to truly understand it um, might be daunting as they're beginning. Right. And so, what, you know, my recommendation would be for them to pick mutual stocks because then they would have, I mean, I mean mutual funds, I apologize, um, because then you have a manager whose job it is to do all the research and monitor the movements and, you know, kind of it um, and buy and sell the, the individual equities within the fund so that, uh, you know, and, and they're rated, you know, Morningstar rates them and, you know, other um, rating agencies rate how those stocks perform just from a, a rate of return and a, um, the, the expenses that they pass on to the, the holders of the, of the fund. I would recommend um, a mutual fund as opposed to trying, oh, I heard about this, you know, this hot stock. Let me, let me, getting on it because I think, you know, as, as um, with most things, gravity does p- play a part in, in investment because you know, a lot of things that go up come right back down. Um, I, I, I would start with mutual funds um, for those people who have not made um, any venture into the stock market as yet. Okay, great. And so for Ryan, the question then is for a more savvy uh, consumer who probably has had some measure of exposure, same question. But what would your best recommendations be to them in terms of what to look for and how to identify the right investment to me? You know, I, I'm going to piggyback what Dalton said, because, mm-hmm. you know, like he said, you know, there, there's risk in everything. So, you know, you can analyze what the environment we're in today when, you know, in the United States where cash is paying you zero or 10-year government ponds paying you 0.65. So you have to look at what's going to make sense for that particular person, because someone that's 70 years old it may not make sense for them to buy a mutual fund that's going to be predominantly in equities. It probably makes more sense for them to buy something that has maybe some equities, but also something that has cash and fixed income. And for someone that's younger, it's probably going to make sense for them to be invested in something that's going to have more equities. And I would totally agree, and our group would totally agree with Dalton in the sense that we typically gravitate more towards the active managers. And an active manager means, just like Dalton said, is that they are trying to identify the stocks that are going to do the best in the short, near, and long term. Where, you know, a lot of investors look at ETFs because they're easy to access. But what our group has found is that if you have sometimes too much exposure to an ETF, like for example, if we take, you know, the S&P 500 today, you know, FANG, which is six stocks, five or six stocks, represents the bulk of the return in that index this year. So by default, you have overexposure to really six stocks that are predominantly technology, and you don't have exposure to a lot of other areas. Where an active manager, like a mutual fund, you know, they will go to where they feel the best area is. And that could be reducing risk at the same time, because you may not have an overweight to one sector or one area of the market. You know, having access to information, I think, you know, like Dalton was saying, is that Morningstar.com is has is a treasure trove of information where, you know, when we're talking about financial planning, maybe I'll go into that in a little bit later, but once you identify how much you can invest in the markets, you can identify which funds may make the most sense for you. And at the same time, you know, having, you know, advisors and bankers in the region, you know, all, a lot of the bankers we deal with on a, on a daily basis, they have very good knowledge on these funds, the managers, and, you know, having access to, you know, advisors like ourselves, the America's group, 
you know, we are always available for those types of questions. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, um, Wendy, Wendy, if I could just say one other thing. I just, sure. This just popped into my mind as, as Ryan was speaking with regards to specific stocks. I think one of the things I would also recommend, and I don't know if this is something that you were going to bring up later in the question, but one of the things I would recommend is that when, you know, for those of us who are parents and those of us who are parents in the region, I think, you know, exposing our children to sound financial um, discipline and, mm -hmm. f and, and, and good financial knowledge at, a, at an early age would pay them significant dividends. And, and, to, so, and to answer your question specifically about stocks, what I would recommend is that when they turn, and you can pick the age, you know, for some people it may be 12, for some people it may be 16, mm -hmm. but you know, th that you may want to buy them a single share of whatever it is that they like yes. at that age, whether it's yes. Disney, whether it's Apple for their iPod, whether it's, you know, and, 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 and I think spend a little bit of time with them explaining, you know, what it is and why you did it and, and show them on a, I don't know, maybe not a monthly basis, not a, definitely not a daily basis, but some, on some interim basis, kind of how right. it's doing right. and, you know, and, and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Dalton, thank you for, for introducing me to one of my passion subjects, right? Children. <laughs> um, you kind of raised it a lot sooner than I anticipated, but, but thank you. And that is such a fantastic point because I remember recently having a conversation with someone who was doing exceptionally well for herself, but she always credits her mom with the fact that every time her mom gave birth, in, in those days, obviously, it was larger families than we're seeing now, mm -hmm. she would buy stocks for her kids. Mm -hmm. And she says, to a large extent, this is what she has lived by, and hence the reason why she's been able to amass wealth, because she has maintained the same discipline. So with that question, let me, let me just change it up a little bit. Charmaine, for you, um, and I know like me, you're a mom, and so very conscious of what it is that you, you, you're teaching your children. What do you think is the best age to begin to inspire our children to save and to learn the respect of money? What age does that look like for you? And is there a rule of thumb? as to what an average monthly saving should look like for your children? So in terms of, of children, for, for me, I have two children, um, seven and 14. Mm -hmm. I started at age five um, and where, you know, they can, you know, they're comfortable at reading and, and, and stuff. So that age is, I would say, would be the recommended, um, mm -hmm. even as part of the education drive that um, we've undertaken as, based on the institutions that I've worked before. Um, we always start at the kindergarten level, which is around um, age five. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's starting at the very basic money management um, principles, how to manage the, the basic allowances, um, how, how there are several money management games that, you, um, that can be utilized with, with children. What I do quite a bit with my, my children is the gathering of coins, you know, the, the 10 cents, or the, the 5 cents, the 25 cents, to ensure that they, they, you know, they have piggy banks from very early, they accumulate those coins, and to show them how to bag and to, to make those deposits into their mm -hmm. account. So even opening accounts for, for persons, most of, most of the banks have young savers, right. where one can go in at, at a very early age, even from the time you are, you, you are, you are as a mother, you are, pregnant, you can go in and, and, and start those, those accounts. Some, some banks allow only when the child is born, then you can, you can establish that amount. For, for children, starting at a very early age, um, especially for some of the schools, they have those savings programs within the schools that also encourage um, the young ones from a very early, early age. Um, so age five, the, the different vehicles that can be used is to start a basic savings account um, to enable an, uh, um, persons to start, you know, the children to go to the bank, practice them to, you know, accumulate their, their cash and, and to go to the bank. For all the kids, for instance, my daughter at, at the age of 14, where she gets her weekly allowance, I, I teach her that from very early, one should start to put aside at least, at minimum, you should try and save at least 25 to 50% of that allowance. Um, because for some parents, we give our children 
you know, huge allowance. I mean, for, I mean, right now, my, my we should have been so lucky when we were growing up, Shami. <laughs> not, not I was going to say, you're taking applications. I like to go to the lunch. <laughs> <laughs> or lunch bags, we went to school. Right. But now the children are getting sometimes on average 10, 20 EC dollars a day. If we teach our children from very early, you get those allowances and you can start to put aside and, and, and amass, you know, sums that can contribute towards acquiring things that um, they may require for school or, or, or it, it can be a want. But the, the important thing is to teach the, the children from a very early age to, to, you know, how to accumulate wealth. That wealth at that, that age would not mean purchasing stocks or, or, or doing do, that type of investment, but helping to contribute towards their education expenses, to uh, acquire gifts at Christmas, whatever it is. But that practice is what's going to help them, you know, in, in the long term. You know, this is, you know, some of the ideas I can put forward. Okay, fantastic. Um, as you spoke, Shami, I, well, I, I, I know that at some point my son is going to hear this. So, DeAndre, I'm sorry, your allowance is not going to be doubling anything. <laughs> And soon, <laughs> um, so we have to make the yeah. But um, you know, as you spoke, I, I, I'm thinking about the young entrepreneur and how they begin from a financial planning standpoint. And this is not only for young business persons, but certainly I think that as anyone in, embarks on um, their journey towards retirement, that there's, there should be certain thoughts that they begin to think of. So let's talk a little bit about financial planning. How early should one start? What does a financial plan look like? And what areas really should be covered? Um, who wants to take the first go at this one? I, if you want me, I, I can I can, t- I can take it first because what, what, what one of the things that we look at financial planning is kind of look at it as a four-step process. And the first step in the process is actually making the commitment to commit to financial planning for yourself. That That is really sometimes the biggest hurdle is making the commitment to not only yourself, but your family. And then once you make that commitment to do it, because it takes a little bit of time, is that what we've provided to the workshops, we provided two, two basic forms. And really these forms are three pages. It, it's giving you basically the assets and liabilities of your family. And once you have that general idea, and this is not just for a family, this could be for a single person that just came out of school, mm-hmm. is that once you have a general idea of what your assets and liabilities look like, it takes you into the third phase. And the third phase would be developing that plan to accommodate wherever you're at in life. And it's not the same for everybody. So someone that's 22 coming out of school doing it, theirs is going to be a little bit different than someone's maybe in their mid-30s is starting to have a family. And then once you develop that plan, the fourth part is monitoring and making change. Because I think we can all agree is that when you have a financial plan, we tend to look at it as more of a guide to get you to where you want to be at some point in life. And that being said is that, you know, there's a lot of times in life, that there's things that pop up, don't take into consideration. Like no one really knew that COVID was going to happen this year. Right. We've had conversations, just making adjustments to people's financial plans. Because, you know, when you make that plan, you say, okay, I'm going to start saving X. But if something pops up, you may need to adjust that. And that's right. really why we try to make the financial plan is flexible as possible. Because look, in 1995, you could invest 100% of your bonds, I'm at 100% of your portfolio in bonds in the United States, and you return 7.5%. If you fast forward to that today, to achieve that same 7.5%, almost 80% of your portfolio has to be in, in global equity market. Why? Because it's been a coordinated effort by all central banks around the world to lower rates. So, you know, when rates went from that 5 to 8%, down to zero, for someone that's just starting, we need to tweak their financial plan. Or if someone that's getting closer to retirement, we have to tweak that maybe to be a little bit more conservative. Right. So we kind of of look at it as a four-step process. And I think the biggest one is honestly just making the commitment to yourself and your family. That is the biggest one to commit to. I mean, what about in the local context? I mean, we, we often hear our consumers speaking about the fact that our interest rates uh, maybe uh, not as competitive as they would like them to be, or um, perhaps not as competitive as other institutions. In the context of what Ryan just shared, and the fact that even on a global scale, one has to continue monitoring, what best advice would you give to consumers or customer base in terms of the investments and making sure that they're monitoring? Okay. So in terms of um, investments from a Caribbean um, standpoint, um, the um, Wendy, just just repeat the the last part of your the context is from the consumer yes. from a small, small business person starting off. Well, our customer just, base, our customer base broadly. 
so it can be uh, small business individuals, but we often hear that our interest rates are not really competitive within the banking field, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but From a the- deposit standpoint, a right, depositor right. standpoint. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So it went, again, it's, it's context. Um, even right now when customers, I mean, generally come in, if, again, rates, if you compare rates right now in, in our region, say 10 years mm-hmm. ago, you will you you would be able to get a a a five percent interest rate on a on a CD. Um, today on a on a on a term deposit, one can really get a maximum of around two percent, which ties back to the the savings rate. Um, a, a, for most financial institutions, we have to balance that against the our loan rates, where ro- loan rates have come down significantly. A few years ago, um, a bank could have given a mortgage um, comfortably in a competitive space at around 8 to 10%. Today, mortgage rates are down to below 5%. Um, and so, you, you know, so as financial institutions have to balance that between that 5% loan rate which in terms of their earnings right. and what they pay out in terms of cost. Right now, interest rates on deposits for depositors that are looking for higher yields, uh, rates are at the, at the bottom. Um, on right. EC funds, again, that 2% compares favorably um, uh, when you look at rates paid outside of our region, where there, there, there are no minimum savings rates. Um, mm-hmm. Ryan can speak into, in terms of the, the U.S. Um, you get point nothing on your, on your savings deposits. Um, we are fortunate to still be earning uh, as, as depositors 2%. They're, they're, I mean, for, for staff, for, for depositors, at least there are still alternatives. As I mentioned um, before, one can venture outside of savings and go into um, fixed income securities like treasury bills and bonds um, if you want to generate more, more return. Um, even those um, fixed income um, um, options, are, the rates are also declining. So again, what the, the balance here, especially as, as, as you plan your, your finances, is really to balance risk and return. Most persons said, okay, I want a high return, but with high returns comes with the, the high risk. Um, so again, it all depends on the risk profile of the, of the individual. Mm-hmm. Um, if your objective is to preserve your capital, um, the important thing for one in that bracket is to ensure that your funds are at least 90% of your funds are in fixed income where the, in, the, the income or the interest on, on those um, assets are, um, are low, uh, uh, carry a lower risk. Um, if you right. look at higher returns, you would have to to into equities, et cetera. Um, so the options in the region, I'm, I'm, I, I still feel the, the options are more favorable um, mm-hmm. than outside, um, especially, as I said, um, with a savings account. The savings account carries very little risk. Um, and to generate a 2% return in this environment, um, it, it, it's a good return. Okay. Um, so that's what I would say in terms of our region um, with regards to investment options that are available for, for one. Okay, great. So here's a little twist. And Shamin, I'm going to keep you on for a minute. Um, in, our, in our cultures across the region, we typically hear people say that they do not like credit or, you know, they want to pay this off as quickly as possible. So even if you give uh, 10 years on, you know, a piece of land, 15 really, but if you give 10 years on a piece of land, then you hear the person saying, I want this paid off in five years. Is that really the best use of money? And you know, how does it relate to your investment goals or your retirement goals down the line? Okay. So, okay. So in terms of debt, um, if, uh, again, if to, uh, again, looking at the topic of creating wealth, yeah, Mm -hmm. one would have to leverage throughout their lifetime or their working life to acquire assets. Um, So the example you you raised, um, Wendy, where, someone comes in for a land loan, a 10-year loan, but they right. paid in five. What that would mean for that individual is that they would reduce the number, the amount of interest and the number, the, the term of the loan. Right. So the amount of interest that they would have paid the bank over a 10-year period would have reduced down to a five-year. 
um, you know, mm-hmm. um, period. Um, so that, that, that would be one benefit. But the, the other benefit would be, um, the, the other side to that, I, I should say, is that that extra payment that that person is making would be coming from their, you know, their, their wealth or their income. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you have to balance that, um, again, looking at the cost of the debt versus if I kept those funds on a, a, savings, a, a savings deposit at 2% and if my cost is at 8 I may be better off paying, paying down that loan faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because the cost side to it. Um, so there's nothing wrong in someone, um, you know, paying down on a, a loan earlier than the, the maturity of the loan. Um, again, weighing the cost benefit of, of doing that. With interest rates at a low now, and, and again, you're still generating a, a reasonable interest on, on, on your deposits, one can say, okay, I, I, let, let me have that loan run so I, at least I can still build wealth um, in, in, other, in other assets while I pay down my loan. So it, it, it depends, again, on the cost, the cost of the debt. Um, some persons... You, there, are, there are some um, persons that come in, some consumers that really do not like debt. So they acquire the loan today and they, they, their aim is to finish it in short order. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some borrowers that will write the, the loan um, and while they still build, um, you know, additional wealth through the, the you know, the whatever excesses in their, their income. The rule of thumb that one should, should look at is to ensure that your total debt payments to your income does not exceed um, 45%. So once you're operating within those, that benchmark, that prudential benchmark, then that, that should provide some comfort in terms of being able to afford that, um, those, that, that debt payment or debt payments. So, so, that, so in, 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 in a nutshell, is, is really balancing, again, looking at your income, looking at what that debt represents to income and, and, and looking at the cost of debt, the cost of that debt. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Do we, do we really think that, and this is, you know, quite an interesting talking point, do we really think that credit is a good strategy if you have the cash available for a spend? So, for example, let's, you know, I'm going to be really extravagant. I'm going to take a vacation to Hawaii um, because I can. Uh, the funds are there, it's available to me, and I'm going to pay for my entire vacation from my savings. Is there, you know, a thought that says that I really should perhaps look at financing that through credit for a year because it's a vacation, I want to do another one next year, or should I go ahead and use my cash? Can I start on this one? It, 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 in, the, in, the, in the case that you've just outlined, mm-hmm. I would strongly advise mm-hmm. against using credit. For that, I, I think that, and 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 the reason I would say that is because I think that use the use of credit really should be for something that is tangible and that may you know ultimately appreciate. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I think that if you have the the cash, and then you should pay for your vacation, and you know, as as we would say, and just kind of keep it moving. Right. Um, if you are saying, well, I have the cash and I really would like to buy, you know, a, a Mercedes Benz S class, mm-hmm. um, or, or a piece of land or m- maybe not the S class cause cars depreciate, but a piece of land, let's say. And so I want to buy a piece of land and should I finance it or should I pay cash for it? Again, I think it goes back to the point that Charmaine was making which it just depends on the cost of the, of, the, of the loan, the interest that you're paying on the loan, and how much you can get as a return on the cash if you kept it. So to the extent that you, you know, you're, you're going to pay, I don't know, 3%, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in, um, in U.S. terms and not necessarily in Caribbean terms, but, yes. but, but, okay, but, but let's just say for the sake of argument, you're going you're gonna to have to pay um, 6 or 7% on a, on a car loan in, 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 yes. in an island, and you're only getting 2% in interest or, or in, as you invest your funds, you may get, you know, through a diversified portfolio, you may get up to about 5%. Then you, if you have the cash, you will be making five percent on it. Um, is that really w- w- would it 
I think then, in that case, um, you should use someone else's money and keep building and, and making your 5%. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, in, 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 that, in that instance. But, you know, some people may have a different, um, may have a different philosophy. Right, right. The other question that I want to jump to, and then we're going to move along in age and we're going to begin to look at retirement. (laughs) (laughs) Because I think we we really want to try to cover, you know, a broad spectrum Mm -hmm. and a life cycle. Mm -hmm. But before I go on, this is a burning one. And I will invite all of you actually to give your views on credit card, uh, good or evil. Let me just be blunt about it. Um, Because it it, it does require a level of discipline and management. So perhaps, Charmaine, because you are in corporate banking, what is your advice on managing credit cards? Okay, so in terms of credit cards, one of the the first thing I would say, um, a credit card is a necessity in today's environment. I mean, it allows... Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I'm a banker. I I, I need credit cards to be so... (laughs) ...to take on credit cards. But the important thing for a, a credit card is that one, some, one rule of thumb I, I, we always advise is that your limit on your card should never exceed your, your, your net income. So if your net income is, say, 5000 you should not be operating a card at a, at a, an out, an, a, a limit of, say, a, of 8000 mm-hmm. Or at any one point that you can pay off the balance outstanding on that card, you know, over a, a very short period. Um, one, of the, 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 one of the things to note on a, a card is that credit cards carry high interest costs. In our region, it can range as high as 19.5 to as high as 23%. Um, so that is, that is a significant cost, that if one is using a card to, do, to, to consume, that is a significant cost that they, they carry. In, yeah? um, the, the, in terms of the disadvantages, I would say, for cards apart from the, the high cost, which is significant, um, if you continue to make just the minimum payment on a card monthly, mm-hmm. that, that debt that, that is outstanding would take you many, many years um, to repay. Um, I can give a, a quick example. Um, I think I have a, a calculator mm-hmm. right now. So if, for instance, someone has, has maxed out a, a card at a limit of, say, 3500 3, a month, um, a limit of 3500 as the limit of the, of the card at an cost of 23%. Um, when that individual would have gotten statements from the bank, you would have to, your minimum payment, which is what would be stated on your statement, would be $175. If you continue to just make that minimum payment, it would take you about 103 months to repay that small balance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And not to factor in the charges that have continue to accumulate as you go. So how does one manage and ensure that they don't find themselves in the position where they're at the maximum limit and just making minimal payments from the onset? Yeah, so the extra payments. So mm-hmm. if you're minimum 175, you should be making anything above that. So right. 225. So for the same example, if you made a a payment of around $225 monthly, that would reduce that down to 19 months to repay. Mm-hmm. Right. So these are some of the, the thought-provoking um, questions that the con- customers really need to be discussing with their banker or that the banker should be advising the customer. Um, yeah, so that's that people, advisory. Right. Mm-hmm. yeah, that should be part from part of the advisory. Um, right. Uh, at least at my bank, we, we do that as part of the application process. Once you've excellent card, it's part of that um, counseling that we provide. Okay, perfect. The other question that I really want to touch on before we move on is asset versus liability. We often hear people saying, okay, my home is my asset, but there's a mortgage to the bank where they're making a monthly payment. Do we re- really consider that an asset at that stage or a liability? And when does that home truly become an asset. Dalton, do you want to jump in with that one? Yes, I, I, I will. I mean, I, I, that's a very good question. And, and, and um, I think it's something that our customers should really be um, made aware of. Mm-hmm. So you, you are correct in that when you acquire a home, you're basically signing an agreement with the bank that says that you will make payments over some time horizon, 
that be it, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Um, and once at the end of that, you will now then um, have title to the home. Um, the, so the asset in that instance, the, the value, which is really the value, the asset, sits with the home because in, in essence, you can sell it for some, some amount of, of money, let's say $300,000. But at the beginning of that um, agreement with the with the bank, you also owe the bank, you know, three hundred dollars in principle. In principle, um, you know, it in in it's a significantly higher number um, when you take all the payments and you know when you in, include the the interest as um, in your in in your calculation, and so to say that you know you 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 have an asset. It's not really an accurate statement when you're referring to your home. It it is you you have a um, you have something that has value that in hopefully I mean I, I think time has proven that it, the the value increases. You know it, you know it may go up and it may go down, but over the mm -hmm. long haul. Over the the, the, the long the, the, the time horizon, you know, ten to thirty years, mm -hmm. the value will go up. Right. Um, and and so, as you are making the payments and your liabilities are coming down, and the value of the house is going up, at some point, you know, you get to where the lines cross, and you owe um, less. You know, right. significantly less mm -hmm. than what you would, um, you know, you can sell it for, and you know, and 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 at that point, it becomes a little bit more of an asset than 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 it is um, when you first started. Because I think the the thing that people have also have to remember is that let's just say, for the sake of argument, the same three hundred thousand um, dollar home, and you're making payments for 10 years on a 30-year um, mortgage, the majority of the payments that you're making in the first 10 years are primarily interest payments. They're primarily interest That's payments, right, yeah. you know, just kind of, it's, it's primarily interest. So, you know, if you were to, say, let's, and, and they're looking at it and they say, oh, well, now it's after 10 years, it's worth $350,000 and I only bought it for, um, for, for 300. So, you know, so that means, you know, I'm, I, I, I've got $50,000 that, you know, I can take out of it, um, you know, or they've, or, or, and I've been making payments for, for, um, for 10 years and I've been paying 3000, you know, so that's 30, that's, that's, um, that's, um, 36, that's, that's the, well, $300,000 known. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be 3000. So let's say I'm paying $1,500. So that's 18. So that's about 180,000. So really, I really have um, 180 plus 50 that I can get out of it. And then, you know, they go in and they sit down with their banker and, you know, the banker says, no, you might be able to walk away with 75,000 or something like that, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're lucky. So, so I think they, they, there needs to be that. I, I think it goes back again to having a good relationship with your banker Right. And who can guide you and inform you as to what your true um, net worth is, because you know that is where you take your liabilities away from your assets, and you're kind of left with what what's left over. And that is, you know, somebody that you know your, your banker, may they be um, your loans officer or or relationship manager, depending on 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 your relationship with the bank they can certainly guide you through that. But a house in and of itself is not truly an asset from the perspective of how much value or how much cash you can get out of it or how much value you can get out of it if you, if you really are in a bind. Excellent. All right. So as we begin our wrap up of, of today's discussions, and I'm sure that everyone listening would agree that it has certainly brought certain issues to light. Um, let's talk a little bit about retirement because we're all going to get there hopefully someday, right? Um, what is the best practice in terms of when do I begin to plan for my financial retirement? We will all retire, but hopefully we will be financially healthy when we get there. What does that process look like? And maybe Ryan, um, I can ask you to lead with that one. 
Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think like we've all echoed on this call, the earlier, the better. Right. Because the earlier you plan, the more you'll be able to pull out of your account in retirement, in your retirement savings in retirement. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of times when people think about, oh, I'm going to start, you know, there's really no magic number to start with because the way we look at it is, I'm just using round numbers. If you have, let's just say $10,000 you want to start with, we always recommend keeping at least 70 to 80% of that in cash because if you're starting your investment process, it's like Dalton said earlier in the call, you want it to compound at a long rate of time because that's how you're going to get your maximum amount of return. Mm -hmm. So what happens is a lot of people, when they start, they'll overinvest. You know, they'll put all of their savings into some type of investment portfolio. And, you know, when you see times like we're in today, you know, if you need access to your money, what do you have to do? You're going to sell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what we try to do is manage that in the sense that, you know, when we start investing, you know, we always recommend keeping cash on the sidelines for a number of things. You know, the first thing is, like we said, you know, for expenses that come up that you're not aware of, you know, a lot of things happened over the last six months, that things that you may need cash for. And the also is to, you know, potentially buy at a cheaper price. So you've had two of those factors happen in the last six months. And then, you know, it's, it's the process of evaluating it at least once a year, because things are going to change in your life. Things are going to change in, in, in where you want to be. And as you get closer to retirement is looking at your investment portfolio. And it may not just be, you know, investments per se in stocks, bonds, and cash. It could be, you know, what we're talking about real estate. It could be other types of things And looking at that and to try and determine, determine what type of income you can pull off those retirement assets. And typically what we say a general rule of thumb is you can expect to take four to five percent off of your portfolio. So if you have a portfolio of say five hundred thousand you retire, you can expect to pull between twenty and twenty five thousand off of that with not affecting it long term. And then the way the reason why I'm saying four to five percent, it depends on when you start. Right. The earlier you start, the more you can pull out later in life. The later you start, the less you can expect to pull out. Right. Okay. Yeah, that, that's definitely very interesting, in, especially in terms of the, the way that you've just put it, it, the ability to actually draw on your retirement funds, particularly for some persons who retire and there's no uh, opportunity to continue to earn any monthly uh, in, uh, revenues, it then, you know, colors the entire portfolio and your plans for the future. So these are all things that we need to be sure. very in mind as we plan for our retirement. That's correct, because if yeah. you don't, because if, if, if you're pulling out four or five percent and that money's not at least doing something for you, you're going to eat right. your principal, that's and right, which you yeah. don't want to have happen because over time your principal will erode. And that's really what you don't want to have happen. OK, so this is going to be our final question. And thank you for that, Ryan. How do you protect your investments? Is there a, an opportunity to protect investments um, and even your assets? What are the best vehicles available? I mean, let's start with you in the in the banking sector. How do you protect your assets? Okay, so one uh, one of the, the the known ones that uh, we we use typically is insurance. Yeah, right. Um, mm -hmm. And so, if you own a home, one should ensure that the their home is insured. Um, so there's property insurance that covers to protect um, to protect that asset in the case of natural disasters, fire, etc. Um, and even as um, professionals, um, where according to the field that you're in, one should ensure that there is also um, insurance, professional insurance to cover them against, um, for instance, errors and omissions, malpractice, etc. in the case of doctors. Um, and even bankers, we have what we, we call um, directors um, and officers insurance that will help protect us. Um, because those, those liabilities can affect, um, you know, uh, um, our ability to earn and then to protect our assets. You also have in the for, for commercial entities to ensure that there's commercial liability insurance. There's also workers' compensation insurance. Again, that all of that is to protect the, the entity. Um, for, for vehicles, um, the auto insurance. Um, there's also what you call um, an umbrella coverage that would basically cover your assets. Um, and so, you know, in terms of 
the, the basket of assets that one, one has to ensure that the, the coverage is sufficient um, to cover. One of the things I think we mentioned, one of the, um, my colleagues mentioned, um, it's important as part of your monitoring because um, to ensure that in monitoring your investments or your assets um, on an annual basis, preferably to ensure that you have suffici sufficient um, insurance coverage. Um, because what happens in the case of uh, particularly a home, um, one may build a home today, um, may extend on that home, and so the value or the replacement cost of that home may have increased but our right. insurance is still at the, at the old values. Because in the case where you underinsured, that may have implications when you yes. did a claim. Um, so insurance is a, is a critical element of, of protection for, for both your wealth and, and, and likewise your, your assets. Mm -hmm. Another area for in terms of asset protection is all not over, over leveraging. Um, and I think we, we spoke up about, um, about net worth earlier on. Where you find when, when you do your assessment as, a, as, a, as an individual, you look at, or even a, a corporation, you look at your assets, less your liabilities. If you, that figure is a negative um, um, figure, you really, basically that is the, the typical cause of, of bankruptcy that we, we, we see where assets are over leveraged. Um, so in a case where someone may start um, a, a loan today to, to acquire a home, but over time, they would have added vacation loans to that. They would have added vehicle loan to that, depleting the value of the, 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 the asset itself. Mm -hmm. um, so that computation of asset less your liabilities, because a lot of the, that debt may also involve unsecured, unsecured financing. That may deplete your, your overall net worth um, and, and also result in, in, in bankruptcy. So preventing... Um, being over, over leveraged is one that should be avoided as part of your protection of your other assets that you own. So I would, I would speak to those two. Um, um, in addition, in terms of businesses, the, the formation of a business. Yeah, yeah, um, so where if you're an entrepreneur um, and you establishing an, an entity, so if you establish an LLC or limited partnership, that would provide greater protection rather than a sole pro proprietorship. Um, so, it, so all of those in terms of the establishing of an entity, how you establish it um, can also provide protection for your own, um, your own assets. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of a, a sole trader, if um, you know, there is any, in, in terms of that, that sole trader going insolvent, where creditors can have access to your own personal um, assets. Mm -hmm. um, so, the setup of an entity is also critical um, to uh, providing that protection. So asset protection, I would say, is a critical component of the whole financial planning process. Um, and really, it's intended to protect um, one's assets or your wealth. Right. Okay. Well, truly, I think that this discussion has brought to light, like I said earlier, um, the ability to answer a number of questions that we know float around from time to time from the customers who are supported by our members throughout the region. And so in closing, I really want to say a huge thank you to our panels, Dalton, Ryan, and Charmaine. And I also want to invite you to leave any parting thoughts, best practices that you think would be beneficial to our listening audience today. Ladies first. <laughs> Charmaine, I think Dalton has handed that over to you. I think, you know, again, I, I, I thank you, um, Wendy, and your team there in St. Lucia for putting this, um, <clears throat> this podcast together. And as, as I said at the beginning, I, I think it is a really important topic for discussion and for dissemination to our, our members across the region and for their customers as well. Um, I think the, there are a couple of things that, that would that come readily to mind as big takeaways from everything that my, 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 um, my colleagues have said in, in, thus far. And, and the first of it is, the first one is that in planning, you, well, first of all, you have to plan. I, I think Ryan's, Ryan's point is, you know, un, until you, you've, you've actually developed a plan, you're kind of stumbling around in the dark and you, you and it's, but yes, you may, you, may, you may be successful, but I think with a plan, it is more likely that you'll get to your destination, whatever mm -hmm. that is. Um, in, in, in uh, you know, as you, 
have desired. And the, the second thing that I would say, and then now I'll, I'll stop speaking, is I would um, say the earlier you've de yes. you de de designed the plan and you start implementing the plan, the better off you'll be. So planning and starting early would be the two things that I would take away. Um, I, I think would be the two big takeaways that I'd like the listening audience to have. Great. Thank you so much for that. Fantastic. Ryan? Dal 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 Dalton stole my first thing. <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to echo it again. Look, planning is obviously, I think we can all agree, and, and I'd like to thank you for putting this together. I think we've had a very uh, informative debate here going through very important topics for everybody. And, right. you know, understanding the importance of planning. And I think Charmaine had touched on this. The investments are important, obviously, but when you're dealing with you or your family, you know, the estate plan is almost as important as the investments because you want to make sure that your family's assets are protected if something happens. And I think Charmaine hit on that, but I think that's something that maybe in the next discussion we can go through further, but that is something that we firmly believe in our, our group and, you know, being in the region, you know, my partners have been in the region for 30 plus years, something they really believe in too, is making sure that the family's estate is, all, is set up properly. And, and I think you asked a question about, you know, protection. I think one of the crucial things that we always tell people is that knowing what you own mm -hmm. and going through the process of a financial plan is not just dollars and cents. It's knowing exactly what you're invested in. And I think Dalton kind of hit on, you know, sometimes people look at their homes as an asset. Well, if you owe close to what you paid for it, it's really not an asset. Right. And going through, you know, an investment portfolio is, you know, when things go like we're in now, we've been in a time of crisis for six months, is that when you look, if you have an investment portfolio with stocks and you see that you're invested in companies that have a positive dynamic change that are helping the world, a lot of those companies did really well in the last six months. So if you know what you own, you won't make a rash decision and make a bad decision that could, that could potentially impact your retirement. So with that, like I said, thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you inviting us on here. And if you have any questions, we're always available. And I will submit um, those two forms if anybody wants to see that's listening to this, the uh, family financial balance sheet. Thank you. Awesome. Ryan, you also sent us before we started um, the goal planning and monitoring goals and resources and budget data worksheets. Are those okay for us to publish on our website? Correct. Yep. Those are fine. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, before I, I wrap up, I just want to see if Charmaine was able to join back. Charmaine, are you on? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm on. Okay, great. So Dalton tried to, to really help you out of the hot seat there because it's always difficult when you go last, right? Um, yeah, so okay. yeah, because the, um, the, uh, the uh, um, Ryan and Dalton has taken all what I wanted to say in closing, but for me, what I will leave as my, my last closing um, is to encourage everyone to save and invest regularly. Yeah. Um, one thing to note as individuals, um, we, our paychecks are not increasing. Our paychecks every month that goes by is one paycheck left. So if you are age 30, you are fortunate to have 420 paychecks. And if you, like me, um, head in, in, in the mid-40s, I have 240 paychecks left. But if you now at, at age 55, it's now at, uh, it's 120 paychecks left. Anybody outside of that, the paychecks are very little. So oh, my God. <laughs> Charmaine, you really, you really brought that one to life for me. <laughs> I'm probably down to six paychecks. I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, but but I think you know to your point, Charmaine. That to your point, that's really how we need to look at things, right? We need to be able to sit down and dice it so that it actually makes sense from a numerical standpoint. Exactly what we're looking at in life, right? So that that was really, really was a good uh, depiction of. The, the real deal is in your face, right? Yeah. All right. So again, I want to say a huge thank you to Dalton, Team Raymond James, through Ryan for your continuous and ongoing support, Charmaine for taking time out to be with us this afternoon and continue to listen out for more podcasts on what we know is important to you as we continue to advocate for a stronger, more resilient um, economy for our members and also for our general public. Um, just to get you started on your journey, we would look at publishing for you on our website, that is cab-inc.com. 
uh, an online engagement for children. We spoke about ensuring that your children get into, you know, the habit of savings and in the mindset of savings. So there's something on there for the children. Uh, as you begin to consider your planning goals, and even if we, we continue to stress that it should have happened back when you were 20, if you're, if you're at 20, good for you. If you're in your teens and starting your first job, even better. And if you're like me, who knows everything that we should be doing, but probably is a little difficult getting started, we're putting something on there just for you, your goal planning worksheets. Thank you to Raymond James. And during our discourse today, you would have heard uh, Ryan speak a little bit about uh, as you approach your retirement and understanding your investment options, that you can visit Morningstar.com. So we will continue to populate those sorts of resources for you on the CAB website. We invite you to continue to listen, continue to share your thoughts and opinions as we continue to bring to you during the month of September any and everything that we think is valuable to you from a financial literacy standpoint. So please continue to listen and support, and we look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Team, thank you so much for being on today. Have an awesome afternoon. Thank you, Wendy. Thank, thank you. you. Wendy. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again.